This is a University of Otago podcast. So welcome, Karen. Dr. Karen Pratt from the College of Education. So, yes. <laughs> I do love it when all you've got to do is stand up the front and people clap. <laughs> Let's hope you're still clapping at the end. So um, I'm going to talk to you a bit about just the overall kind of distance learning program at the University of Otago College of Education, which is a mouthful, so I will probably shorten it. So I just thought that 30 years of um, distance teaching at the university was a great time to just kind of look back on where we've come from as a college and, and, and perhaps where we're looking at going. And when I kind of reflected on it, what really struck me is just that there's a set of things that have really stayed the same and another set of things that have just changed completely. So I'm just going to kind of share some thoughts on that and Wim will tell you when I get it wrong. <laughs> So just by way of introduction, um, education's been offering online papers since 1997 when Wing came and started everything up. Um, I came along three years later in 2000 and started teaching online in 2004. Most of our papers, as I think he alluded to earlier, were our postgraduate papers, but we did, especially in those early years, have 300 level papers. We offered one on ICT and education and later I taught a research methods paper online. And as I said, it has changed a lot. Um, currently, almost all our postgraduate program at the, at the college is online. We have usually one or two papers each year that you can do on campus. They frequently get cancelled through lack of numbers. So the majority of our, of our students are um, distance students. We've, we've actually just, just, that's just changed slightly because we've now got a Master of Teaching and Learning program, which is an initial teacher edu pro education program, which is on campus. But otherwise, students doing our programs, we've got you know, PG certs, DIPs, masters, and a doctorate all online. And as I said, you know, two things that I really, when I thought about it, that have really undergone a lot of change in this time are the context and the technology. So I'm going to talk about them. So <laughs> if anyone knows the history of the College of Education, you know that something that has changed a lot is who we are. So before I joined, there was a Department of Education, and I think I've got all the dates right. We then became the School of Education in 2000. We became a Faculty of Education in 2004. At some stage in there, we also jumped in and out of being part of the Faculty of Social Sciences, but I couldn't quite remember when that was. We then merged with the College, Dunedin College of Education in 2007, and thankfully we have kept our name the same since then, which is good because I have got a drawer full of old business cards. We have a lot of wasted stationery. We have during that time, I mean it looks really stable 2007, 2016, no name changes, but we have undergone two managements of change, a major restructuring and have another management of change looking likely. So our programs have been delivered amongst this huge kind of change for our staff. It's, yeah, <laughs> it's been fun. <laughs> um, just the papers we offer have just also changed, mostly in terms of um, numbers and scope. So, Originally, back in 1998, we had four papers. We currently have around 40 distance papers on our books. We don't teach all of them, but we keep them on the books in case we want to teach them. We normally offer around 15 papers each year. Um, originally, we only had ICT papers, so we offered um, the 300 level paper and several 400 level papers around information and communication technology and that's now expanded as we've you know expanded so we offer entire programs so pretty much anything we've got we offer via distance so huge changes also on top of it which is um, and one of the biggest things changes I found personally was changing from teaching about IT in a distance environment where there was kind of an expectation that people understood how to use a computer to when you're start suddenly teaching quantitative research methods to third year students who didn't want to be there. It was a compulsory paper. They used to greet me by saying, we don't want to do this, I don't want to be here. And it went from being a face-to-face -face course they didn't want to do to an online course they wanted to do even less. It was a big learning curve. <laughs> um, and as I said, we, we know, we've now got programs that are specifically de um, designed for, for distance. So we've got our postgraduate certificate in teaching and our diploma in teaching started in 2000 a Master of Teaching in 2004 and an ADG which started in 2008 and which Wing's going to talk about tomorrow, some other time. Um, and sitting along those, you know, our standard BA Honours, Postgraduate Diploma of Arts, we've got a Master of Education, all of those also include our distance papers. You cannot actually do a postgraduate qualification with us without doing a majority of distance papers. 
there's also been changes with our students. We've got kind of two groups of students. We've got our standard BA honours type students who have come through the education pathway and BA. And for them, life has pretty much gone on unchanged. But our others, other students and those who are mostly doing our postgraduate programs are teachers who are wanting to gain further qualifications, increase knowledge. Some of them plainly say they just want a pay rise. But that means that a lot of our, our context is bound on what is going on in initial teacher education. And so as requirements for initial teacher education has, have changed, so originally you know, diplomas to degrees to now they're looking at whether or not you need masters, we've seen corresponding changes in terms of what the desire is for postgraduate study and the kinds of needs that are, that are out there. So that's also influenced and affected what we do. And I should, should acknowledge too that the person who has implemented almost all these changes, in fact probably all of the changes, is Wing. So, <laughs> um, so I mean our context has changed, but, but the, the kind of the most obvious thing when you look back is just how the technology has changed. I mean, it's actually been quite, quite good fun going back and looking at things and just seeing how things have changed. So originally we had two systems for online courses. We had uh, websites and we had web crossing for asynchronous discussions. Students had to log into each of these separately. They could use the university login for neither of them because it wasn't hooked up to the university system. We did a lot of creating passwords. So this is what it looked. Please note the Netscape. That kind of amused me. I was like, how long is it since I've seen Netscape? <laughs> um, so this is what a typical paper looked like. And if you look, you'll see that there's, there's a school metaphor going on because learning management systems, you know, all that kind of thing was new at this time. And so it was designed to be familiar to, to teachers. So there's a filing cabinet which contained all the resources. There's classrooms, which is the asynchronous discussions. Um, their office is where things like their grades and that kind of thing went. So yeah, <laughs> the rolling text bar. The welcome to the School of Education in the middle, that was a rolling text bar that got updated with important notices. And then the numbers along the top, each one represents a different week. And when you clicked on them, you got the information for that week. So here you'll see this is week one. And there's three tabs, the introduction, what to read, what to do, that just spout out to them exactly what they were supposed to be doing. And how it used to work is, you know, as, as a lecturer, I would be given printouts of the previous year's work and if I wanted to change anything I would make the changes on the hard copy and then I would give it back to the person who knew HTML and therefore could make the changes. And no one could do anything with the, the asynchronous discussion boards apart from Wing because you had to learn web crossing's own set of codes to do anything and so he had to sit down and learn them all. And so we couldn't change anything unless he knew how to do it. So this is, this is what at the the classrooms kind of look like. Obviously, I'm not taking them into individual classrooms because the students' names in there, but you can see, you know, you clicked on it, you could see what's new, what, what you could read. So, yes, things have changed a bit. So, in 2007, when we merged with the Dunedin College of Education, we, we decided to, it was time to reassess the system, partly because Wynn could no longer remember the codes and none of us wanted to. <laughs> It had been a while, none of us wanted to sit down and learn them, um, but also because DCE was using Blackboard, and so we thought we do not want our students using two different systems and our staff using two different systems, and so it was time to reflect on what we wanted. And we considered switching to Blackboard, which of course was the university supported tool, but we didn't like some of the functionality and um, didn't feel it gave our distance students the best experience, so we made the decision to switch to Moodle. And so this is an example of a Moodle page, um, you'll see that we've got rid of the school metaphor by now. By now, it was, we were almost having to explain as much what the metaphor meant as, as just putting the actual names because people were just that much more familiar with the kind of language used. You know, they understood that kind of thing. You'll see it's still very much arranged in the same kind of ways with the, the weeks and the conferences. But So that was a typical Moodle page. And we had someone who knew the language to do all the Moodle things too. In 2000 and end of 2014, start of 2015, we made the change to Blackboard. This was, um, I have to say, not a, not a pedagogical decision. This was because our Moodle server broke <laughs> and the funding situation meant that while we'd been away, able to get away with using something that wasn't centrally funded, 
well, they couldn't see that it cost us anything. As soon as we needed the money to buy a new server, they said, why aren't you using the centrally supported system? So we switched to Blackboard. <laughs> and it hasn't been all bad. Um, we had a very short time to turn around the switch, and we had lecturers going, oh my goodness, I've been teaching on Moodle for eight years. Now you want me to learn this new system in two weeks. So what um, we did was try and set it up to make as look as much like Moodle as we could. So typically, we'll have links at the top, which is we will put, if you click in there, you see resources, you'll see the course book, you'll see links to any useful material, anything like that. Otherwise, things are very much arranged in their weeks or conferences. So the idea is if you click in that week, everything you need for that week is in there. So a typical week, you'll see there's a, a learning guide, which is what's taken place of the old introduction, what to read, what to do. We often still have those sections in there, but now you scroll down for them rather than having to click on separate pages. Um, links to discussions, any assignments or anything that, that, are, that are due are all accessed from within that page. So the idea is it's a one-stop shop for whatever they're supposed to be doing that week. Um, the activities are what we've, they're our version of um, participation in the online discussions and what they are varies from course to course, but that's another conversation. So a lot of changes, but on the other hand, when I looked at it, there were a heap of things that stayed the same too. And I decided that wasn't all bad either. So one of the things that, you know, there were actually elements of the context that did stay the same despite all the changes. We still do serve the same two groups of students we've always served. And when you look at our professional students, so the ones who are mostly doing our distance papers, they are still mostly female, mostly teachers, mostly working full time and juggling work, study, family, life, etc., etc. They're mostly very experienced teachers and they're usually returning to study after some time away. They're often quite nervous about studying, they're confident in their professional knowledge, but you throw them in an academic environment and use academic language and they're not quite so sure. Um, as you'll have seen through the different kind of technology slides, our standard course activities haven't changed that much. So our courses still tend to be arranged around one or two week topics, or we tend to call them conferences. We have a learning guide type things that explains exactly what they're supposed to be doing. We use a lot of asynchronous discussions. Um, we've tried synchronous activities on and off throughout the years, but trying to get a group of teachers all over New Zealand and sometimes all over the world to be available at a certain time is impossible. There's always a sports practice or a staff meeting or something. I think we did work out at one stage that something like 4 a.m. might work, but someone went running, so that didn't work either. <laughs> and some of us like to sleep. Um, we still tend to have um, all our papers are fully internally assessed, and the assessments are a mix of formative and summative assessment. Um, we usually have at least one group assignment although that's often optional and students often opt out of taking the group assignment. And we usually at least one of the assignments is related to their practice in, ve in a very direct way and the others in a, in a less direct way, if that makes sense. <laughs> Another thing that really hasn't changed is kind of the key pedagogical underpinnings that kind of have directed the decisions we've made. And I mean, this is, I, as I look at it, it's kind of a real testament to wing that, you know, however many years on, 19 years on, the, you know, the, the, the basic structure still kind of holds true to what we, what we believe in. So the kind of the whole ethos of the courses is, is around this idea of social constructivism, so the idea that our students are learning from each other, that you know, whoever is teaching the paper is not the fount of all knowledge, but that we are going to work together and create meaning. Um, So, you know, in our papers, that's seen through having, you know, a lot of the asynchronous discussions. We often, you know, there's, there's the more, uh, more knowledgeable expert who is often the lecturer, but we also, in most of our papers, have student-led discussions so that they're actually doing the research and taking the role of that more knowledgeable um, expert. We've, students are encouraged to kind of design their own learning goals around them. So a lot of our assignments and things are very flexible so that they can direct them in the way that suit them. I so say, Wing's heard all this a thousand times. Wing knows this, he designed it. <laughs> um, we've done a lot of, you know, we've, we've framed our papers around the community of inquiry framework. So we focus a lot on social presence, this idea that we really are people, we're not just, you know, a computer robot responding. Um, cognitive presence and teaching presence. 
So, I mean, social presence is one of the key reasons we didn't want to shift to Blackboard originally, because in their discussions, you couldn't put photos, and what we found was that having photos beside your posts meant people really did actually see that the person posting that, those comments was actually a real person and not just this text on a screen. And so, you know, when we originally looked, that wasn't possible. It is now, so we're much happier about having to shift. So, yeah, we, we encourage students to introduce it themselves, and the lecturers, you know, just tell us a little bit about you, your goals for the paper, your family, etc. Um, lecturers will often share details of their personal lives. So, for example, I send out a weekly email that just reminds them what they're supposed to be doing for that week that usually starts with something about what I've been doing, you know, hi, hope it's been well, it's been gorgeous in Dunedin as always, so I've been out in the garden kind of thing. Just, just little things that help them see me as a real person. We also have what's called the social forum, which is uh, an online discussion where the lecturer doesn't look unless there's a complaint. So students can use it as much or as little as they want, but it's for those questions, comments, conversations that you have with people. You know, it's the conversations we were having at the afternoon tea break, whether it's checking understanding or talking about the rugby, but just a place where students could communicate as people without the lecturer kind of being there as this scary presence. Um, so cognitive presence, you know, as I said, we've, you know, the course has been designed around this idea of students making their own meaning rather than us um, providing the information. It's obviously a little more difficult with some courses. If I'm teaching quantitative research methods, for example, and they need, they need to know what an ANOVA is, then an ANOVA is what an ANOVA is. It's a little hard to have a discussion around that. But how they understand it and how they apply it is certainly something that you can add meaning making. And teaching presence is all about how you design the learning environment to make sure that teaching and learning can do it. So we've tried to keep focuses on things like having a clear and consistent layout so that students are actually able to focus on the content of what we want them to be learning and thinking about, not trying to find their way around the pages, not trying to worry about terms, not trying to learn how to use yet another piece of technology. So we've kept the technology requirements very simple as well. Which it's just as well because I was teaching a paper this semester where I had several students who struggled with the technology requirements. They had great difficulty with the internet, which astonished me in this day and age, but also because the paper was called Introduction to Internet-Based Learning. So I kind of figured that they knew that they needed to have access to the internet to do it, but apparently not. <laughs> and as I said, that real make sure that the focus is on what we want to teach, not how we're teaching it. Um, Anderson also talked about the idea of three different types of interaction. So the idea of um, student to content, student to student, and student to lecturer. And that's something we try and think about and implement in all our courses so that we've got all the different kinds of interaction happening. We also try and make sure that we've got it happening through different media so it's not all just communicating via an asynchronous discussion, but there might be emails, there might be videos, there might be phone calls, etc. as well. So just, just trying to change things up and, and suit everybody. And of course, there's always the issue of distance and how distance can lead to misunderstandings. And it's, this always interests me because whenever I go to overseas conferences with asynchronous discussions, they talk about issues with flaming where, you know, huge fights erupt in the online discussions and I sit there and go, gosh, I have enough trouble trying to get them to disagree with each other even slightly. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's something that you need to consider is just that, you know, that it's, that it's easy to misunderstand, much easier to misunderstand when you're only reading the text on the page. So, you know, we try and think very carefully about the forms of interaction and what's going to work in which situation. Um, transactional distance also talks about the need for students to have control over their own learning and to, to understand the individual needs, which kind of sets itself up in opposition to a community base and also to a university which insists that papers have start and finish dates and that assessments have to be in and finished by certain times. So there's, it's kind of a, it's that one of those tension areas, I think, where we try and manage how we do the two. So um, that's something that's ongoing. But... Something else we've kind of that hasn't changed is our recognition of the need for support. So we've found that our distance students have quite different support needs, or there's a different emphasis on the support they need. As I said, they're typically older, part-time, and working, so they're trying to juggle things. So time, motiv time management, and motivation. And if you've got a choice between doing the work you're paid for or trying to find time for um, your online study, you know that's a lot harder. Um, 
And because it's a distance paper, they need to have those elements of independence. So we try and build in um, support for them. And when, when I thought about it, I kind of find five areas where we, we emphasise um, and, and think about this support. And so part of that, you know, specific course and content support. So, you know, I'm not understanding this. You're talking about this theory and I don't even know how to spell it, let alone what it means. And that kind of support is, is provided by the lecturer and we, we encourage them for lecturers, um, encourage them to contact the lecturers and things. And in fact, something we're working on at the moment is a series of expectations so that students and lecturers know exactly what they have the right to expect in terms of support from, their, from each other. They certainly need general academic skills. As I said, they're usually coming back to study for some time. They don't even necessarily have a degree. So things that we take for granted as lecturers, they might not understand. So in that resources area on the, um, on the web pages, we always have links to useful resources that includes things like links to the library, links to the Student Learning Centre. We've got um, resources that we've found from a variety of places that we direct them to. They need support around just coping with distance learning in general. So again, we've got the links and things, and also the way we design the course is aimed to support them in that area. We've found that the general institution is an area where they need support. And something we've found that works really well is having a single point of contact. So navigating the university and the very, I mean, I don't know how you find it, but I'm trying to get an answer to a question that seems very straightforward to me at the moment. And I think I'm into my fourth month and my fifth different person trying to get an answer to this question. Imagine if you're a distance student and you don't actually even know how the university works and you're trying to do this. So we try and provide support. So the thing is, if you've got a question about anything, ask us. We'll either tell you the answer or we'll find out who, will, who can give you the answer and either get it from them and pass it on or put you in contact. But we try and do the running around rather than them. And of course, there's that whole wider issue of distance learning. And this is where we kind of work with the distance learning office and things, and, and more in kind of often in a policy or advocacy kind of role. So one of the things we've been kind of discussing for quite some time is that a lot of the seminars and things that are put on for postgraduate students are not available online, which means that none of our students get to see them. You know, how hard is it to have a, have a session recorded? And I mean, especially these days when you've got lecture capture in the big lecture theatres, why can't they just turn it on so that students can at least see those seminars? So that's kind of the fifth level. The other thing that hasn't changed is that right through distance learning at college, we've had a research program going. This is just a sample of the research pro projects and grants we've been doing. I figured you didn't need to hear details on them all. But it's something we've kind of committed to is not just using the, the HEDC evaluation, but also identifying particular areas that we want to focus on and improve and seeing what we can find out and do. So looking forward, we'll obviously continue doing what we're doing and try and make sure we're providing the best possible experience for the students. And then I kind of went to future gauge and went, gosh, I don't know. Who knows what's coming? I mean, back, back when Wing started, could he possibly have predicted what was going on? So I decided I should look and see what famous philosophers said about this. <laughs> I think Morpheus says it both about, you know, about my presentation, you know. I didn't come here to tell you how it's going to end. I just told you what's begun. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I'm looking forward to the next 30. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. <laughs> Questions for Karen? <laughs> Elaine. Thank you for that um, novel interpretation of philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> but for a very interesting presentation too. Now I was really struck by your research at the end there where you talk about evaluating distance students, like their experience of distance learning, because this is a challenge that we've faced. And we've done online evaluation for summer school and we get a really good response rate. Well, I think at about 60%, that's pretty good response rate. But for the distance students in summer school, it's really low, it's abysmal even, in fact. Although I think, you know, from my point of view, 17% is abysmal. Um, I've actually heard lower than that, considered to be an acceptable level of evaluation. Um, if you've got any suggestions or could, could say something about what you know around evaluating distance, students in a dis a distance learning, I'd, I'd love to hear more about that. We've had the same problem and especially, do you remember the old days when you used to have to post the evaluations out and they had to post them back? And I know, I mean, 
Um, my husband, before we married, was doing distance papers, and I remember packing flats for him one year and discovering several completed evaluations that he just never quite posted back. <laughs> so, I mean, we've got the same issue, and, that, and the, the response rates have increased now that we can, they, they, they're emailing, them, you know, filling them in online rather than doing it, but it's still really low. Where I have seen much better results is where I've done things like tied it into a particular program. So um, my poster tomorrow is going to be talking about a paper I run where I, I did some ch changes and then and I talked to them about the fact that I'd made these changes because it's internet-based learning paper, so we were talking about what we were practising kind of thing. And I said to them that I wanted to see what they thought and that I was going to be doing this, this evaluation and all but one student responded. So I think if they understand the meaning and the context and it's not just another generic one, mm. that helps. We also try um, a lot of our papers the final week as a reflection and an evaluation week and if we build it into that and go kind of, you know, you know, things to do this week, fill in your evaluation and, you know, and as you're thinking about your evaluation, perhaps share some thoughts in the online discussion or something like that, but, mm. but no. And I always write on my evaluation forms, you know, this is a small distance paper, the response rate is low, you know, four out of eight students responding does not tell you whether my teaching was good or bad. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> Wing. When we first started, we had a problem of trying to justify why you do distance learning and what are the results how comparable those uh, distance papers compare to the on-site papers initially. So doing the university survey, the evaluation is not enough for us. So that's why we had to uh, do research projects. Like we got several actually Cal grants in doing that, um, doing in-depth in in interviews with students, with the questions we had in mind, and write papers to sort of proof that we really were on track, right? So if you really want to understand your student, I don't think the routine university survey would be enough. I don't think that is, well, I think it's too superficial, those questions asked. You really need to have a research project, doing more qualitative rather than quantitative interviews with the students. I think that has to be done if you really want to know about your courses. And in fact, as an academic, I think it's good because then you have one stone and two birds. So you, can, you know how to teach, and at the same time you have a publication, and you can do research on teaching, which is recognized by the university as a, a contribution uh, to, your, to, your, to your research. So I encourage you, if you are teaching online courses, do some research on your courses. Yeah. We're lucky because we're in education, we're expected to be researching about how we teach, so... I feel the urge to talk about evaluation at this point. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but, that, but, but that is true. The, the university questionnaire is not intended to tell you everything about it. It is one little piece of information. And the sorts of techniques that you talked about in building into the course, directing students' attention to it and making it a reason, a reason making the reason for them to fill it in or to give you the feedback is part of the, the way to, to encourage a higher response rate. But anyway, thanks. Paul. You mentioned uh, formative assessment. So could you just tell us, you've, you succeed in getting your students to do formative assessment and what sort of things do you succeed in getting them to do? Um, we do formative assessment Often it's combined with some form of summative assessment, but those so things like um, one of my papers, I had them write an essay on an issue related to internet-based learning. And after I got an essay that was a brilliant essay but had nothing to do with internet-based learning and therefore had to get a really low mark, I went, this is not good enough. And so what I now make them do is submit an essay proposal where I then give them very detailed feedback. Like, I write more than they do. They tell me broad outlines of what they're planning on doing and then I give them very detailed feedback that they can then use to actually direct the essay. So that's something I do. We've got several, several staff in their assessment. Part of their, so their first assessment, they get feedback. A lot of, they've got several marks and their next assessment relies on them showing that they have addressed the feedback from their previous assi assignment. So yeah, so 
what we have found is that our students work best when we give them marks for it. Because they're trying, especially if you're trying to decide whether you should, as I said, do your work, you know, or play with your child, or you, you know, you're trying to say, no, no, I need to, to work on this assignment to help my understanding. That's hard to justify. But if you can say, I've got an assignment, and I need marks for it, then it's much easier to justify. And time is up. Yes. yes. Uh, so thank you very much, Karen, and thank you for all the questions.